in this lecture, I'm going to introduce you to um, density functional theory, right? So a brief recap of the two approaches to solving the Schrodinger, the Schrodinger equation. So as I mentioned uh, in my very first lecture, there are two broad approaches. Uh, one is called the variational approach, which we just covered in the last two lectures. So in the variational approach, you expand the wave function as a linear combination of basis functions. So things like the Hartree fault and also the beyond Hartree fault methods. Um, in the variational approach, you basically what you have is essentially a matrix eigenvalue problem, and um, you, solving that matrix eigenvalue problem gives you the you're showing the uh, solution to showing the equation. Okay. Now. The advantage of the variational approach, as I mentioned before, is that there's a very clear path to more accurate answers, right? So you can see this in the beyond Hartree fault methods. So as I increase the number of basis functions and I increase the uh, number of clusters and uh, configurations, uh, essentially what I get is the exact solution to the showing the equation. And I know how to improve on my Hartree fault solution. Right, so there's a very clear hierarchy. So I start with Hartree Fock. If I want a graph answer, uh, it's not very good uh, for energies, but uh, it's quick. And if I want to get more accurate answer, I can go to MP2. And if I even want a, uh, if I want an even more accurate accurate answer, I can go to MP4. And if I really want a gold standard answer, I can go to CCSDT. And uh, as long as my computing resources allow, I can uh, I can get more and more accurate calculations. Okay. Now density function theory is a very different approach to solving the Schrodinger equation. Okay. Uh, in principle, uh, as you you will see in the next uh, few slides, it is in principle exact. So in other words, the formalism of DFT is exact. In practice, you will see that there is a lot of approximate schemes, okay? Um, the advantage of DFT is that compared to the variational uh, and quantum chemistry methods, the, the computational cost is comparatively low, right? So given the same accuracy, uh, DFT methods tend to be cheaper than uh, solving the, uh, using the correlated methods of uh, the variational approach, okay? Um, the downside, of course, is that uh, the path to getting better answers is not as clear, right? And uh, especially for solid state uh, systems where you have periodic boundary conditions, uh, DFT actually has uh, certain very notable uh, advantages over the quantum chemistry approaches, okay? So um, as I said before, uh, UCSD is actually the birthplace of DFT. Um, so there's these two, the two main papers that uh, establishes the whole foundations of density functional theory uh, are these two papers over here. One is called the homogeneous inhomogeneous electron gas uh, by Hohenberg and Korn. Okay, you can see that basically uh, it is written at UCSD, and then um, subsequently, just about a year later, um, Korn and Sham uh, actually gave us a method to use the equations that was established, uh, the principles that was established by Walter Kahn to actually solve um, a solution to the Schrodinger equation, okay? Um, so, um, of course, uh, Professor Lu Sham is still a, a professor at UCSD, um, so, uh, and in 20, March 2022, uh, both of these papers already have more than 57,000 uh, citations each, okay? Now, interestingly, um, those two papers are not actually the most cited paper in DFT. Um, if there was this publication uh, back in, I think this was written in 2010 or so, where uh, Nature actually compiled the top 10 cited papers in uh, each uh, of all time, right? And um, two of the DFT papers are actually in there. Uh, one is called the development of the Coley's Savetti correlation energy formula into a function of the electron density in 1988. And then 
there is this uh, method which uh, this paper called density functional theory thermo thermochemistry the role of exact exchange uh, this is basically the paper that establishes the b3 leap method and uh, later we will talk about what the b3 leap method is and um, these papers are because this functionals or this this um, parameterizations of functionals are so widely used by um, researchers everywhere they are actually the most cited paper uh, what some of the most cited paper in all of uh, science okay all right so what are the theorems that establish the foundations of uh, density functional theory right so there are two theorems uh, they are called the Hohenberg Korn uh, theorems the first theorem is called the existent theorem it just simply states that for any system of interacting particles in an external potential, the density is uniquely determined. So what this means is that the external potential is a unique functional of the density. Okay. Now, um, the second theorem is called the variational theorem, which uh, essentially uh, is a statement of the variational uh, principle uh, for um, the density function uh, for DFT, okay? Um, the variation th theorem simply states that a universal function of the energy can be defined in terms of the density and the exact ground state is basically the global minimum value of this function, okay? And these two theorems basically um, establishes that um, instead of working with an external potential with many, many different electrons, you can instead now work with the electron density instead, which is a function of um, three coordinates in space, right? And you can also use the variational approach to basically solve um, for the energy based on the density of electrons, okay? All right, so um, the first theorem is actually very simple to understand, right? And it's actually, uh, the proof is relatively straightforward, so uh, we can actually show you how to go about proving um, the hohenberg korn existence theorem, right? So, um, the proof is uh, using what is called proof by, um, proof by contradiction, all right? So, the idea is that you first make an assumption uh, of uh, that is the reverse of what you want to prove, and you show that if you, as you make that assumption, you it leads to a contradiction that cannot be true. And in doing so, you show that essentially that your uh, original assumption was false in the first place. Okay, so, um, so the, the way that the Hohenberg uh, existence theorem is proved is shown as follows. So let's say we have two different external potentials, V, uh, v of A and V of B. So in other words, you can imagine that you have two different uh, arrangements of atoms, okay? That somehow they correspond to the same ground state uh, electron density, rho naught, okay? And of course, the two different ex external potentials will have two different Hamiltonians, uh, H of A and H of B. And let us assume that the ground state wave function and energy for each Hamiltonian is uh, psi naught and uh, E naught, okay? So... Uh, from the variational theorem, I know that if I take the wave function of B and I do the inner product uh, with the um, Hamiltonian of A, because the wave function of B is not the ground state wave function of A, um, basically the energy must be greater than the energy of A to begin with, right? So, um, so this is uh, by definition true, okay? Um, so we can then make a uh, rearrange this a little bit. So we subtract H of B over here, and then we add back H of B over here. And um, H of A minus H of B is just uh, basically the difference in the external potential between the two. And this term here is basically your ground state wave function of B uh, with the inner product with your uh, Hamiltonian of B that gives you basically the energy of B to begin with, okay? Now, um, so, Basically, um, this is essentially just an, uh, this integral is basically the integral of uh, V of A minus V of B 
with the charge density of B because the inner product of the wave function of B is basically just the charge density of B and the charge density of B is basically uh, rho naught, okay? And you integrate this over all space. So you then basically have this statement over here. And if you swap the A and Bs uh, over in this case, what you get is basically the reverse relation as well, right? In other words, that your energy of B must be smaller than the integral of V of B minus V of A rho naught plus E of naught, uh, uh, the ground state energy of A. And then if you sum the two, these two just cancels out. And then basically what you get is that uh, E of E naught of A plus E naught of B must be smaller than E naught of B plus E naught of A, which cannot be true, right? Because by definition, these two are equal. So in other words, the original assumption that um, the two different external potential can have the same ground state energy is therefore false, right? So uh, what it, this essentially uh, shows that these two different external potentials must have a different uh, ground state energy. In other words, there's a unique ground state electron density associated with each um, uh, external potential, okay? <clears throat> All right. So, um, so that in a nutshell is what the Hunhubert Kohn theorem states, okay? And uh, what is the consequence, right? So the consequence is that the Schrodinger equation, which is uh, originally in 3n electronic coordinates, okay? So remember, you have the three coordinates of each electron, and if you have n electrons, you basically have 3n electronic co coordinates. And now you no longer have that, right? So instead of trying to solve the showing the equation using 3n electronic coordinates, I can now solve for the showing the equation based on the electron density. And the electron density is defined in just three-dimensional space, okay? So in theory, okay, as you notice uh, in the previous example, I have uh, none of the proofs actually made any assumptions, okay? So... Uh, the Hohenberg Kohn theorems are exact, okay? So in other words, there is no assumptions made in the proof of the theorems themselves. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that there is no recipe for what the uh, functional of the density is, okay? So in other words, um, Hohenberg and Kohn has, proved, uh, Kohn has proved that basically there is a unique electron density associated with each external potential and that you can use that to basically solve for the showing the equation based on the energy but you do not know what the functional of the density is right so in other words it is a very nice theory it's beautiful right but uh, it is actually quite useless in terms of actual uh, actually using it to solve the showing the equation okay now, uh, this is basically where the uh, uh, Lushem and Korn came in and basically they gave you gave us a method to actually use the Hohenberg Korn theorems to um, solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So uh, I'm going to now uh, do yet another switch of notation. So remember my Hamiltonian for a system of atoms. I basically have the kinetic energy terms the interaction between each uh, electron and the nuclei and the electron-electron repulsion, right? So uh, this is my electronic Hamiltonian. Re as you recall, we actually already um, ignored the effect, uh, the nuclei-specific terms based on the von Oppenheimer uh, approximation, right? Now, um, based on the Hohenberg Kohn theorem, the energy uh, as well uh, and everything is basically just a functional of the density. So I'm going to um, call my kinetic energy uh, this symbol T, my nuclear electron uh, interaction as this external potential V, N of E, and the electron electron repulsion is basically V, E, and e, e of E. Now, since my energy is a functional of the density, a functional just simply means that the energy is a function of the density, which itself is a function of the atomic coordinates, okay? So, so E is basically a function of a function, okay? That's why it's called a functional. And then uh, by extension, basically my kinetic energy, my uh, nuclear electron repulsion, and my electron electron repulsion, uh, all these are also functionals of the density, okay? 
Now, uh, basically what the corn sham ansat says is that we are now going to create a fictitious system of electrons, right? And this uh, fictitious system of electrons do not interact. And they live in an external potential that is called the Kornsham potential, such that the ground state energy uh, charge density is identical to the charge density of the interacting system. Okay? So, in other words, uh, what Korn and Sham has created is instead of trying to do the impossible, which is to really try to solve the density functional theory equations from the full interacting system. I need to create this imaginary system of electrons that somehow they do not interact with each other, okay? And they live in some external potential, which is uh, what is called the Kornsham potential. Um, and, but in a way, uh, that um, imaginary system of electrons that do not interact also have the same charge density as the uh, actual full interacting system of electrons, okay? So you can think of this as uh, somewhat similar to the hartree fock um, mean field approach, right? So when we did the hartree fock approach, uh, we also create this imaginary system where uh, we have an electrons that's interacting with a mean field of electrons. So in the Kornsham ansatz, we are e creating this imaginary uh, individual systems that uh, individual electrons that do not interact at all. Okay, now. In this case, um, what you then have is that you can actually uh, now uh, split the terms of the energy, okay? So we still have our kinetic energy term. However, now my kinetic energy term is split into this non-interacting electron kinetic energy term and this correction to the non-interacting uh, electron uh, energy term, okay? Now, because the charge density is identical to the charge density of my interacting electrons, uh, this external uh, this interaction between the nuclei and the electrons is still the same, so there is no problem. And of course, we still have our electron-electron repulsion term, uh, but now we do have a correction to this electron-electron uh, repulsion term because, by definition, because I assume that my electrons do not interact. Um, yeah, in the Kornsham system, I have to correct that uh, to give it the correct electron-electron um, repulsion for the full interacting system, okay? So, um, in other words, we just do this um, redefinition of terms to basically get this uh, expanded uh, solution, right? Now, so in the Kornsham, Kornsham uh, so what then this gives us is basically what is called the Kornsham equations, okay? So, uh, in other words, the energy uh, as a function of the density is then given by this uh, kinetic energy of my non-interacting electrons, my nucleus nu nuclei, nuclei nuclei repulsion term, uh, sorry, no, my nuclei electron attraction term, and then this uh, electron electron interaction terms, which are, and this is for non-interacting electrons, okay? And then finally, we sweep all these correction terms, okay, into this thing called the exchange correlation functional, which is also a functional of the density, okay? So, uh, what we then have is that we can, we now actually have a separable um, um, function, uh, Hamiltonian uh, for the Kornsham equation, okay? So you can see that all these are summations of I, okay? So basically, I can define my one electron operator for my Kornsham equation, uh, one electron Hamiltonian for my uh, Kornsham equation as basically the kinetic energy term, my um, nuclei interaction with each electron, uh, and this um, electron electron repulsion term and then also this, uh, which is basically the interaction of the electron with the overall charge density, okay, of the system, and then this exchange correlation term, okay? And once you actually have this one electron operator, essentially what you can do is that you can use the same approach as you use for the Hartree-Fock equations to basically solve 
to do a, a self-consistent field calculation for your uh, indiv uh, one electron energies and then you can sum up the energies to get your uh, total energy and you can also get your charge density by basically um, doing the inner product of all your wave, uh, one electron wave functions and summing them all up, okay? Now, um, so you basically, the um, how you would go about solving the Kronstrom equations is basically similar to your Hartree-Fock uh, self-consistent field approach. You first construct some gas uh, uh orbitals uh, within some basis set that you would choose. You then uh, create a circular equation, you solve to get new orbitals, and then you keep iterating under, until convergence, okay? So the, the uh, as a procedure-wise, um, there is really not much difference between the Hartree-Fock uh, self-consistent field approach uh, versus um, the Kronstrom uh, self-consistent field approach, okay? Now, um, there are um, some very important differences between Hartree-Fock and DFT. Um, Hartree-Fock is approximate. In other words, we know that we are making an assumption of the mean field interactions, but you can actually solve it exactly, okay? Um, DFT, on the other hand, is the opposite. It is formally exact, but um, we don't know, there's no, um, there's, we do not know what this uh, exchange correlation functional is supposed to be, okay? So far, we have not talked about this thing, right? And this is basically, I would say, the key choice that you actually always make when you are doing a uh, uh, density functional theory uh, calculation, okay? All right. <clears throat> so uh, just to show you the flowchart of your KS solution, uh, if you compare this with the Hartree-Fock um, um, solution, you will see that it is almost the same. You start with some initial uh, gas of your orbitals in which you then create your uh, spin densities, okay? You then calculate your effective potential. The effective potential is basically just your external potential plus your Hartree potential plus this exchange correlation uh, potential. You then solve your one electron uh, Kronstrom equation, uh, equations, right? So then you then get your new charge density and then you check whether, well, is my charge density still uh, very much different from my initial charge density? If it, it is not uh, consistent yet, I'm going to redo, take the orbitals from my new electron density and then I'm going to redo this whole series of calculations again until I reach convergence, right? And once you actually have a, a self-consistent set of um, electron, uh, one electron wave functions, you then output your, uh, you can then get your output charge densities as well as things like the energy, forces, stresses, eigenvalues, uh, so and so forth, okay? All right. Now, um, there are some limits of Kronstrom theory, okay? So uh, first of all, the eigenvalues are not the eigenvalues to add and subtract electrons, uh, except the highest eigenvalue in the finite system is indeed the negative of the ionization energy. Um, so what this also means is that um, very often, you actually, uh, within Kronstrom theory, your band gaps tend to be uh, not uh, very accurate, okay? So... For, uh, this is a classic example. This is the silic, uh, and, uh, the band structure of silicon. And what you will notice is that the uh, predicted um, band gap of silicon, it, we do get the correct type of band gap, which is an indirect band gap of silicon. But our band gap uh, is only 0 0.6 eV, while the experimental band gap, as we all know, since silicon is a very uh, widely used um, solar PV material, the, um, the band gap is 1.1 eV, which is close to the ideal for um, the solar spectrum, okay? And obviously, this uh, band gap is severely underestimated, right? Um, despite this, uh, in other words, um, the, despite this limitation of Kronstrom theory, uh, very often you can actually use the Kronstrom orbitals and energies, even though they are non-interacting uh, electrons, uh, you can use it as inputs to uh, other many-body approaches uh, such as uh, quantum Monte Carlo, okay? So uh, we are not going to go into quantum Monte Carlo in this, uh, in this course, okay? Now, um, so far, um, what I have talked about is basically uh, I have established that the Kronstrom uh, Hohenberg Kohn theorems uh, show you that there is a den unique density 
and there is a uh, you can use vari the variation approach on that density to basically get your uh, solution to the Schrodinger equation. Okay, and then with the Kornsham uh, ansatz, we have shown you a series of steps in which you can uh, use to actually solve the um, uh, the Schrodinger equation based on the electron density. Okay, now. The problem now is that we still have this uh, mysterious exchange correlation functional or Vx of c, right? So, uh, and the Hohenberg Kahn theorem actually does not give you any indication of what this uh, Vx of c is, right? So, of course, if you can uh, find the universal functional, you can get an exact solution to the Schrodinger equation, but obviously. Uh, we do not know what the form of the exact uh, exchange correlation functional is supposed to be, okay? So, let us think about, um, so all the other terms are fairly, uh, are very well defined, so we know exactly how to uh, define them and calculate them. It is only this exchange correlation term which we have no idea what's the form of the exchange correlation uh, functional, okay? So, uh, what is the simplest possible assumption we can make uh, for this exchange correlation functional, right? Now, the simplest assumption we can make is basically what is called the local density approximation. So, what the local density approximation essentially states is that instead of trying to think about some complicated system of electrons, I'm uh, a system of um, interacting electrons. I'm going to assume that my exchange correlation energy is going to be equal to the exchange correlation energy given by a homogeneous electron gas of the same density. Okay, and that basically gives me uh, the LDA or local density approximation. Okay, so. Um, so basically, in the local density approximation, uh, we approximate the remaining exchange correlation term with uh, some local or nearly local uh, density functional of the density. So the exchange correlation that's uh, with so to get the um, exchange correlation energy of my homogeneous electron gas, um, I can separate it out into the exchange energy as well as the correlation energy of my uh, homogeneous electron gas, okay? So, uh, what you see here is basically, I just assume that um, if, if my uh, electron density as a at a certain spot is some value, I can plug that value into this um, density number and I can get the exchange energy of that um, uh, electron gas and I'm going to also do the same for my correlation energy. And then I integrate it across uh, all of um, space, uh, of course, normalized by the density at each point in space, okay? And that gives me my total exchange correlation energy uh, based on the local density approximation, okay? Now, of course, um, if you are doing spin polarized calculations, in other words, you are dealing with uh, up and down spin of electrons, then you have an up spin density and a down spin density, and that uh, that's, then, of course, your um, exchange correlation energies are also functions of your individual up and down uh, spin densities, okay? <clears throat> All right. So, um, the LDA uh, is actually a transformative concept, right? So, what this means is that now I have a very real way of um, solving the showing the equation using the... the DFT approach, I just need to make this assumption that my exchange correlation energy is just uh, equals to that of a homogeneous electron gas. And it turns out that the exchange energy of my homogeneous electron gas is actually uh, an analyt analytical number, okay? So this can, you can actually derive this you, if you look up um, your uh, quantum chemistry, uh, your electronic structure textbooks, they can sh uh, they show you how to actually derive this. Uh, it's basically just give, the exchange energy is just given by this uh, function of the density over here, okay? Now, the correlation energy is a bit more uh, complicated, but 
Because now I only have to deal with a homogeneous electron gas, I can then use very, very accurate methods like the quantum Monte Carlo to basically calculate the correlation energy of my homogeneous electron gas. And uh, there was this uh, very famous work done by uh, Seppoli, who is now a professor in UIUC uh, in 1980 uh, on the ground state uh, correlation energy of the electron gas. Okay, So I now have... Uh, my exchange energy and my correlation energy based on my uh, charge density and then I can essentially for any system of electrons I can just plug it into this equation to get my exchange correlation energy okay now um, does LDA work right so this seems to be a very very simplifying assumption okay and it turns out to, to work actually reasonably well right so um, what you see on the left here is basically the uh, charge density of the neon atom, okay? Um, so the solid line is basically the one you get from an exact solution to the Schrodinger equation, okay? And the dashed line is what you get with your L local density approximation, okay? And you see that actually the charge density is almost... Uh, Com in complete agreement with each other. So in other words, this, this uh, very simple approximation actually seems to work quite well, right? And it is somewhat surprising, right? If you think, of, think about a neon atom, a neon atom is not what you would think of as a homogeneous electron gas, okay? A neon atom does have orbitals and uh, e electrons uh, do have changing densities, right? Yet somehow the LDA approximation actually still uh, gets very, very reasonable charge densities for your uh, neon atom, okay? Now, um, that's not to say that um, the LDA approximation doesn't actually have um, problems, okay? So, um, this is a very large comparison of um, the calculated uh, lattice constants of different solids with uh, semi-local functionals, okay? So we are going to go to the other uh, functionals later, but right now, I think the one that you want to focus on is this black line over here. And the x-axis is basically the error in the calculated lattice constants relative to the experimental lattice constant, okay? So basically you have your calculated lattice constant subtracted from your experimental lattice constant divided by the experimental lattice constant itself, right? And what you see is that LDA have a tendency to overbind. In other words, the lattice constants that is predicted by your LDA approximation tends to be smaller than what you will actually get experimentally. Okay? So, um, this is mainly because in the local density approximation, the bonds between atoms tend to be stronger than what the exact solution to the um, showing the equation is supposed to be, okay? So you actually predict stronger bonds than what they are supposed to be, uh, than, than what you are supposed to do, get with the exact solution to the showing the equation, okay? Um, so the error in LDA, actually, so this basically shows you the error in the LDA exchange energy density of silicon, okay? So the silicon is of course uh, one of the most studied materials uh, in the literature, so um, people have done, uh, in almost every single new method that is developed, people would do a calculation with uh, silicon because there's a very huge body of literature on um, silicon, both experimentally as well as comp uh, comp computationally. And you can then compare your um, results with, uh, with those uh, well-established um, literature results to see how it performs, right? So what you see here is that uh, on the left is basically your um, exchange energy. So in other words, the exchange energy difference between what you get with uh, LDA versus what you get with uh, variation of Monte Carlo, which uh, you can treat it as uh, close to basically what your exact solution to the Schrodinger equation is supposed to be. And what you see is that um, the exchange correlation, uh, exchange energies tend to be too low. So Green just means that the exact solution is larger than your um, exact uh, than your LDA uh, calculated exchange energies. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, your correlation energies uh, tend to be too high, right? And 
interestingly, what this simply means is that uh, your, you actually have a cancellation of terms. So in other words, you are underestimating your exchange energies, but you're overestimating your correlation energies. And that cancellation of terms actually <laughs> lead to something that is uh, roughly correct. So it is somewhat fortunate, right? So the local density approximation, uh, it does not give you actually e extremely accurate results, but because of this um, cancellation of terms in the exchange part and the correlation part, what you end up with is actually something that is uh, fairly reasonable, okay? All right, so, um, so this is uh, one of the early success stories of uh, density functional theory, and uh, this is uh, an early success story from um, uh, based on uh, the phases of silicon. So um, many of you know the structure of silicon, uh, the well-known structure of silicon, which is um, the diamond structure. Okay, and uh, this is probably something that you see in all your uh, high school chemistry textbooks. But um, ac silicon actually exists in uh, many different forms, right? So um, there is another phase called the beta tin uh, structure. And um, so in 1982, um, Yin et al. actually uh, used uh, the LDA calculations to calculate the energy versus volume curve for silicon. And um, this is basically uh, the energy volume curve for diamond, and this is the energy volume curve for um, the beta thin structure. And what you can do is that when, when you actually do this uh, E versus V curve, you can actually do this uh, common tangent construction. And what this com common tangent construction does is that it gives you what the transition pressure of um, going from this diamond phase to this a beta tin phase, okay? So in other words, at a particular pressure, okay, the most stable structure of silicon is no longer going to be the diamond structure, but rather this beta tin phase, right? And uh, this uh, work actually showed that you can, using LDA calculations, you can actually predict this transition pressure to a reasonable degree of accuracy, okay? Um, you are going to actually do the exact same calculation, uh, not the beta tin, structure, but rather uh, some a different phase, uh, which is iron, you are going to calculate the um, transition pressure of uh, BCC and HCP iron uh, in, uh, in your lab number three, I believe, okay? And this is something, this is definitely a figure that you need to keep in mind, okay? So you are going to plot roughly the same plots, and to using this common tangent construction, you are supposed to figure out what your predicted transition pressure of your um, iron is going to be, okay? All right, um, with that, um, I conclude this lecture, uh, this introductory lecture to 